welcome to part four of this video series where I continue to explore the concept of acquiring new coordination and internalizing new vocabulary. I'm continuing my progress through drum kit coordination patterns, funk and rock, and today exploring one of the later sets, specifically set 1.3. Previously, in the first three videos, we looked at moving the bass drum, moving the snare drum, and moving both the bass drum and snare drum together against an unchanging eighth note hi-hat pattern. Today, in set 1.3, we're going to explore the next step and we're going to explore how we can change the hi-hat pattern itself. Previously, we were playing a basic eighth note hi-hat pattern that sounded like this. We're now going to break away from that and play a three note hi-hat pattern that comprises one eighth note and two sixteenth notes. And to achieve a steady sense of groove, I'm going to lightly accent the eighth note with the shoulder of the stick on the edge of the hi-hat and the two sixteenth notes I'm going to play on top of the hi-hat with the tip of the stick. The basic groove sounds like this. Now, of course, as with any new unfamiliar pattern, we need to work with the fundamentals. And the fundamentals comprise what we discussed in the first three videos. We would begin by running through the 16th note permutations on the bass drum against an unchanging hi-hat pattern. So the first four would sound like this. They're the four 16th note placements into which we can play a bass drum. We would repeat the process with the snare drum, keeping the bass drum and the hi-hat pattern the same while displacing the snare drum by one 16th note each time. And then we might practice the same thing with both the bass drum and the snare drum together. And that's going to give us a strong foundation for what we're about to do. That's tackling the actual execution of these patterns. But I've done all this before. This is what we did in the first three videos. Today, as we've moved on to a new set and we've already uh, covered the basics, we're going to explore a slightly more advanced application of this material. So, so today, I'm on page 61. And this is deep into the fatback set of set 1.3 with this new hi-hat pattern. And the idea of the fatback set is we are practicing different bass drum permutations before and after a standard unchanging downbeat on the snare drum. To get really, really interesting, we want to be combining different material with totally different bass drum placements. So on page 61, the first half of the set, running A to H, comprises a three-note bass drum pattern before the beat. It sounds like this. So this is pattern A from exercise 61. Now it goes without saying, when we are working when we are working with quite a syncopated bass drum pattern like that against an equally syncopated hi-hat pattern, we want to begin very slowly and make sure we are lining up. But this is something we would have covered in our initial stages, tackling the coordination. As we progress through B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, that first beat of the bar stays the same, and the second beat, the, the bass drum permutates through the remaining three sixteenth notes. So A to H, a couple of times each, sounds like this. Yes. Then we can start to advance to the second half of the set, which changes the bass drum pattern on the first beat. Now, from I to P, the second half of the set, the bass drum pattern matches the hi-hat. So it runs an eighth note, followed by two sixteenth notes, giving us this basic pattern. So as before, if I run through each exercise from I to P twice each, we will hear the unchanging first beat of the bar and the second beat have that bass drum permutating after the snare drum downbeat. Now, 
Now already, we can start to hear how this has got the potential for some really nice sounding funk fusion material. Now, we want to start combining. We're going to take an exercise from the first half with that first bass drum pattern and combine it with an exercise from the second half with the second bass drum pattern. So completely arbitrarily, I'm going to choose C and M. So C from the first half and M from the second half. So together, they create a four beat pattern or one bar of four four that would sound like this. And this is going to act as our combination for everything that follows. We want to be comfortable with this, with this in as many different ways as possible. So I'm going to start really, really slowly, and I'm going to start moving it around. I'm going to maybe take that right hand to the ride cymbal. I'm going to get the bell involved. I'm going to start experimenting with the hi-hat once my right hand has moved off it, and we're going to see what happens. But to stay slow, uh, to, to really achieve this, we need to stay really slow so that we can pay attention, we can focus, and crucially, as I will talk about in a moment, we want to maintain a good poise and posture. We don't want to start leaning back as the four-way coordination starts to kick in. And you probably saw there, even as I brought in that eighth note splashed hi-hat pattern, there was a subtle sense, just quickly, of as I tried to bring in that left foot without breaking the already quite challenging uh, coordination pattern, my body started to lean backwards. And that is a compensation for a lack of control. The body will start to do that to try and keep its feet in line, to try and keep your feet moving, to try and keep the pattern going. And it's a crutch. We don't want that to happen. You will have seen, uh, if, if you teach, or maybe if you're a student, you will see this a lot. As the coordination pattern, pattern picks up in complexity, people start to lean back to try and compensate. The whole point here is to develop control. We want to be completely in control from the most simple exercise to the most advanced. So as I was running through each step there, moving to the ride cymbal, playing on the bell, playing the left foot hi-hat on the quarter note, playing the left foot hi-hat on a splashed eighth note, all the while I am keen to focus on the control. I am keen to retain a sense of control of poise, of posture, as I say, and I'm not relying on leaning back, adopting an odd angle, grimacing and really focusing, really trying too hard, relaxed control. That's what we're going for here. And ultimately, by practicing in this way, we are achieving two things. We are, of course, increasing our coordination, especially our four-way coordination, as I was just demonstrating there. But also, we are internalizing a piece of vocabulary. And this is crucial to the overall process. We can't just take a book like this and play it A to Z, turn the page, A to Z, turn the page, A to Z, because we're not actually learning anything. It's like doing a few press-ups every day. Okay, on a, on a vague scale, you might get a little bit fitter, a little bit stronger but you're not actually learning anything. You're not actually improving in any one area. The real benefit of this material is the ideas it is able to produce. So we just saw C and M. We've taken two from something like 16 on the page, 32 across two pages, and who knows how many across the whole set. We've just picked two exercises and focused in on it. And it is far, far better to take a smaller number of exercises and to learn them really, really well than it is to just tick off every single one and then move on. So our goal here is quality over quantity, depth of learning, depth of internalization. Now, the final stage in this is to transition into and out of it as part of a larger context. We can't just play... indefinitely. We can't just check, we can't play it unchangingly. We need to use it as part of a larger improvisation. And this is, of course, the aim that we're going for here. Complete freedom.
complete improvisation with this material. So now I'm going to practice transitioning into it from a simple eighth note groove. I'm just going to begin with the simple one where I maintain steady eighth notes on the hi-hat. I'm going to play one bar of that and then I'm going to transition into our combination and then back again, something like this. Now, even though that's a relatively simple process, it is actually quite difficult if you're not very familiar with the pattern you are learning. And what you will find in the first few instances of trying this is you will actually forget the pattern. You will forget the combination. Now, of course, if it's there on your music stand, you're going to be able to glance at it and you're going to be able to remind yourself. That's one of the joys of having this book available. But the whole purpose, as I've said, as I keep banging on about, is to internalize the vocabulary, essentially memorize it so that it is there for us to call upon whenever we need it, whenever we want it. Now, finally, to finish this process, we're going to try and incorporate this phrase as part of a larger context. So now, rather than setting one bar of this, one bar of this, I'm going to improvise much more freely and try to utilize the particular phrase in question as part of an idea, part of a main thematic device which I can latch onto, play for a little while, then transition out of again, all the while trying to, rent trying to retain a sense of musical coherence, of control, and of a just a deep familiarity with what it is I'm doing. So now I'm just going to improvise freely. I'm going to use some of my own vocabulary, some different patterns, but I'm going to keep it relatively simple. And the whole purpose here is to try to use this particular CM combination as my main thematic device. I want to be able to transition into it smoothly, play it, and then transition out of it again. Now, a word of warning... I'm not going to necessarily do this in a really systematic manner. So maybe sometimes I will just play pattern C. Maybe sometimes I will just play pattern M. Maybe sometimes I'll play a subtle variation of them. Or maybe I will just outright play the C-M combination in its entirety. That's kind of the point. The point is to be able to use it, manipulate it, and express it freely, not just play it as A, B, A, B. So let's see what happens. Now, within all of that, perhaps you heard I only played the C or the M combination a number of times. And that's because it's difficult. That's because I've just chosen these two, uh, these, these two phrases at, at random, essentially, and I'm not as familiar with them as I would like to be. So I'm really having to make an effort to consciously remember what they are, try and incorporate them in a way that makes sense, play them cleanly, and then transition back into what I'm doing, all the while retaining a sense of musical coherence. And that's really difficult to do. That was the smoothest I could have done it without taking a lot of time to really focus on those two exercises in general, rather than just demonstrate them for the purposes of this video. But that's precisely the point. That's the point of this style of practice. We are taking ourselves outside of our comfort zone and trying to use the material in a way that makes musical sense. So you'll have heard there I was relying, falling back on a lot of my much more familiar and comfortable vocabulary, really trying to make a concerted effort to play the material I'm practicing, make it make sense, play it cleanly, and then go back to what I was doing again. And it didn't always work, though I think there was an instance in there where my bass drum went astray a little bit. Um, 
But that's the point. That's how we become familiar with this material. That's how we expand our musical vocabulary and become much more technically proficient at playing it. So I wanted this video just to cap off the first section of the book. The first section comprises 10 sets all based on this process. Now I have so far in the in the pre in the pre in the previous three videos in this one, I've explored the use of the bass drum, the snare drum, combinations, linear phrasing, and now changing the symbol pattern itself. That finishes that finishes us off for the first set. When we move on to set two and beyond that, we start seeing more advanced phrasing on the symbols and snare drum, and it's a slightly different approach. So I will tackle that next time. For now, I hope that has given you something to think about, and I hope those of you that have have, have bought this book really enjoy it if you like what i do uh, i would really encourage you to visit my website i offer drum lessons online and of course in the studio i've got an array of publications for you to explore otherwise i'd just love for you to send me a message and say hello and let me how you're doing or of course send any questions you may have but thank you very much for watching i hope this has given you some more ideas both as to your own approach on the drum kit and how to get the best out of this book in, in particular and i do hope to see you on the next one so good luck in your own practice check out the website and see you next time. Thank you very much.